being here. And then I would give uh, Mr. Malos the floor as the first speaker for today. Hello, hello to, to everybody. I'm happy to see some uh, familiar and friendly face here. Uh, and thank you very much for, for joining Vocal Europe. Uh, Vocal Europe, the Vocal Europe is uh, uh, where I'm uh, honored to be uh, the chairman currently. Is I think one of the most uh, known uh, think tank in Brussels, engaged in uh, supporting democracy and supporting dialogue, and in a way supporting democracy meaning to accepting all point of view. And uh, it's not uh, just a mainstream, another mainstream uh, media or think tank. Uh, we just repeat what the others say, but uh, we are very proud to give uh, the floor to all opinions. Uh, as long as uh, we respect uh, the very important European values of democracy, that means that uh, uh, at the end of the day, it's for the people, the sovereignty of the people, which is the most important. I'm very pleased that we have this uh, debate on the question of, uh, of Ukraine uh, and how we can uh, support like, how the European Union could help uh, the resolution of, uh, of that conflict, which uh, for my own concern has uh, been for too long now. Uh, and if I'm very happy to, to, to start this, uh, this, uh, this webinar, this conference, it's because I have, a, I have a personal experience with, with Ukraine, which is, I would say, a little bit painful. Uh, because what I have experimented with, with Ukraine is the fact that the lack of dialogue uh, has uh, mainly come to this uh, situation where I think it's a tragedy for me with uh, uh, deaths, casualties, destructions, uh, a lot of hate, a lot of anger. And if you think a little bit, you can see that uh, why. So the European Union, in my view, is involved in that conflict because it participates in a certain amount, in a certain kind of the responsibility of the, the start of that conflict. And other, I feel also myself a little bit responsible uh, in, that, uh, in, that, uh, in that disaster. Why? Because uh, I remember exactly, uh, because that was in the 2013, I was uh, by, at that time, president of one consultative European institution, European Economic and Social Committee. And uh, we had discussion, of course, with the European Commission, with the Parliament, with other institutions, when was the, the question about the association, association agreement between the European Union and, and Ukraine. And I had conducted uh, talks with, uh, with the Commission, with the Commissioner, Mr. Fuller and others, and to warn them, to warn them about the risk to divide the Ukrainian society among uh, what we could can call people who are closer to the Russian traditions and the other for the West European tradition for, for obvious historical, geographical, cultural reasons. Uh, and when there was conducted this uh, negotiation of the association agreement and including the, the trade part, uh, I always say to, to, to my interlocutors, Mr. Fuller and others, Mr. Barroso, that we should take care to involve the Russian party in, but in this dialogue and, and in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this negotiation. Unfortunately, that was not the case. And we had to these uh, tragic events where I took part. I was present during the summit of Eastern Partnership uh, end of uh, November in uh, 2013 in Vilnius, I even took the floor in front of Mr. Yanukovych for Ukraine, Mr. Hollande, Mr. Merkel, and, uh, and some others, where I say that uh, we should not ask someone to choose between his mother or his father, uh, meaning, meaning Ukraine should not be forced to choose. But it happens what happens. I was present on Maidan. I was even the I think the first and unique president of the European institution to be, to be there, supporting uh, democratic movement, civic movement, but not supporting at all 
the idea of war or hate against Russia or whatever. I even tried during this period to organize some dialogue with uh, the Russian civil society and the Ukrainian civil society, which will conduct, but unfortunately it was so difficult at that time. And I deserve that, uh, that presence in Maidan to be put in 2015 by the Russian Federation of their blacklist among 89 of uh, European personalities, uh, which I found unfair, but that's it, because I was always supportive of that. So now the situation is as it is, but I think the European Union has a kind of responsibility. It has a kind of responsibility uh, to uh, create the condition for a de-escalation uh, of, of a conflict and to avoid other casualties, because I think it has been too long for uh, a nation, two nations, Russia and Ukraine, who have been very close in the past. Of course, we know the historical difference between, between various regions, but, but whatever, I think the European Union itself is a model of democracy and it's a model of uh, reunification. It's a model of reconciliation. I'm French, we have our German friends, and now nobody thinks about hate and war against French and German because we work on that, we work on this reconciliation process. So my point is that really the European Union should be much more engaged than it's now in a reconciliation process. This is the unique way to solve the issue. It's not by war or by other way. But I let now uh, Julia to make a presentation uh, of, a, of a topic and of the speakers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Malos, for your welcome remarks and sharing your experience and this uh, yeah, very personal introduction. And hello to everyone and a warm welcome from my side as well. I am Julia Titelbach. I'm a policy researcher at Vocal Europe, and I am excited to be your moderator at this event today, which is also broadcasted on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. So for the participants that have already joined us, may I kindly ask you to switch on your camera so that we can see you and also interact with you. It's actually more pleasant. And uh, please make also sure that you're unmuted uh, during the speaker's contribution. And then later during the Q&A sessions, you are very welcome to ask questions. Uh, you can do that um, by using the chat function or by uh, using the raising hand function. So, for the topic, following the recent events in Ukraine and uh, around Ukraine's border, we look forward to our experts' contribution and the exchange, of course, with all of you on the EU's role and engagement in solving the smoldering conflict in Ukraine, as Mr. Bolos has already mentioned. Um, with the Euromaidan revolution, Moscow's annexation of Crimea and the war in the Donbas, Ukraine plunged indeed into a tragedy which has been smoldering for seven years and which has, in fact, called killed thousands of people. So several arrangements or agreements have been reached with the intention to end the war in the Donbass. We had the Minsk I and the Minsk, Minsk II agreement in 2014 and 2015, as well as the full ceasefire agreement of July last year. However, lately the conflict has flared up again in the context of the Russian military build up near Ukraine's borders and the military maneuver on Crimea, which both had come amid a spike in the ceasefire violations in eastern Ukraine. And even if Russia has announced its troop withdrawal at the end of April, Moscow retains, according to yes, intelligence information, a lethal force of 80,000 troops and heavy weaponry close to the Ukrainian border. Recently, Ukrainian President Zelensky has proposed actually the cancellation of the Minsk agreements, and he has invited the US, UK, and Canada to participate in the diplomatic process. According to Zelensky, the agreements would need revision, um, as Moscow and Kiev would not have a similar interpretation of the provisions. So, in fact, the uncertainty about the finalité of the Kremlin's action, the difficulties of implementing the provisions of the Minsk agreements, and the prospects of a major military conflict have caused serious inquietude, not only in Ukraine and in Russia, but also among the Europeans. And while Washington has supported, supported Kiev so far with lethal weapon deliveries, the use tactic has been about mm -hmm. conducting pressure through restric restrictive measures with diplomatic efforts and dialogue. Yet, and this is why we're all here today, the smoldering Ukraine crisis is far from being resolved. And the question rises yet again on how the EU could engage in solving the smoldering conflict. 
And therefore, I am very happy and yeah, honored to be joined today by our four guest speakers, which will help us to approach this question from very different angles. Um, Mr. Shelley is our very first speaker. He is the former first deputy minister for foreign affairs of Ukraine, former state secretary for European integration and foreign policy advisor to the president of Ukraine. Currently, he serves as president uh, of Grand Thornton in Ukraine. Our second speaker is Mr. Voloshin. He's a member of the opposition from the pro-life party in the Ukrainian parliament. He is vice chair of the Committee of European Affairs and member of the Consultative Assembly of the Council of Europe. He's also one of the MPs supporting the initiative of reviving the parliamentary version of the Normandy format. After those two um, speakers, we will have a short first Q&A session before starting the second block. Um, with Ambassador Vimont and Ambassador Pfeiffer, who have both distinguished themselves throughout their long diplomatic career. Ambassador Vimont was the first executive, executive secretary general of the EAS from 2010 to 2015. In 2019, he was appointed as French President Macron's special envoy for the architecture of security and trust with Russia. He's also a senior fellow at the Carnegie Europe. And Ambassador Pfeiffer, he's currently a fellow at the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. As a diplomat, he was also special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia, Ukraine and Eurasia on the National Security Council. So once again, thank you very much uh, that you're all here with us today. Welcome to all of you. We are truly delighted that you're here with us today. Um, we will start now with our first expert round and Your Excellency, Mr. Shelley, the stage is yours. Mr. Shelley, you're still unmuted, I cannot hear you. Yes. Yes, perfect, thank you. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the Vocal Europe Advisory Board and its honorable chairman, Mr. Malossi, for the kind invitation to be one of the speakers for today's webinar. It's a great honor and responsibility for me to be with you today and to have the opportunity to express my vision of ways to peacefully resolve the consequences of Russian military aggression against Ukraine. The organizers of the webinar asked me to analyze the short and long-term developments of the multidimensional conflict in Ukraine from diverse perspectives and the EU's contribution to the solving the Ukraine crisis. They asked me to do this in the context of answering a series of questions clearly articulated by them. As a former high-ranking official, I will try in my comments to be as specific and strategic as possible in order to meet the 10 minutes time limit for the, my speech. First question, how do these collate in and around Ukraine, the maiden intentions break the violence and achieve peace? In my opinion, the answer to this question must be sought at two levels, tactical and strategic. The tactical level is used full implementation of the Minsk agreements with the maximum use of the potential of the Normandy Forum. At the same time, I proceed from the idea that the Minsk agreements, in terms of their goals and assets, by agreements on the establishment of a stable ceasefire in Donbass, but not on the achievement of the sustainable peace. It's a very principle for me. By themselves, Minsk agreement, even backed up by the potential, the Normandy format and the trilateral contact group under the auspices of OSCE, they do not provide answers to two fundamental strategic questions. The first one, what will the European security system be like after the complete settlement of the Ukrainian crisis? And the second one, what status will Ukraine have in this new European security system? In particular, Ukraine will be a NATO member or the Euro neutral state like Austria or de facto like Finland or some other status. As a person who for many years was responsible for the Russian direction of Ukrainian diplomacy and had the opportunity uh, to participate many times in negotiation with the personal participation of Russian President Putin, I am sure that without a clear understanding of the answers to these two above-mentioned questions, 
Russia will never agree to the peace formula for Ukraine, especially if this formula allows for the possibility of Ukraine's membership in NATO. Based on the above, I give the answer to the second question of the organizer of the webinar. Could the Normandy format France, Germany, Ukraine, Russia be the main tool to achieve the escalation? My answer is yes. If under the de-escalation in Donbass, we mean an achievement in the region of the full and comprehensive ceasefire region. No, if under the de-escalation in Donbass, we mean the achievement of sustainable peace in Ukraine and around Ukraine. In other words, the Normandy format is a diplomatic format of a tactical level. Yeah. Mr. Shali, you're you're muted again. Maybe you accidentally um, pushed a button, but we cannot hear you. And yes. you are hearing me from what time? I think just the last sentence. It was just for for Very some seconds. Okay. Based on the above, I give an answer to the second question of the organizers of the webinar. Could the Normandy format, France, Germany, Ukraine, Russia, be the main tool to achieve the escalation? My answer is yes. If under the escalation in Donbass, we mean an achievement in the region of the full and comprehensive ceasefire region only. No, if under the escalation in Donbass, we mean the achievement of sustainable peace in Ukraine and around Ukraine. In other words, the Normandy format is a diplomatic format of a tactical level within which the maximum that it's possible to achieve, it's only a stable ceasefire in the Donbass and nothing more. Not to mention that the Normandy format does not include the issue of Crimea illegally annexed by Russia. At the same time today, there is no diplomatic format at all that would allow negotiating the settlement of the Ukrainian crisis at the strategic level. That is at the level of seeking for a formula for sustainable security of Ukraine within the framework of the new European security order. The military aggression of Russia against Ukraine in 2014 completely destroyed the Helsinki foundation of the European security. And it's obvious that its restoration is not possible without finding a formula for sustainable peace for Ukraine within the, its border of 2014. It seems to me that that is this area is a huge potential for possible strategic initiatives of the European Union for resolving the Ukrainian crisis. This is my answer to the set question of the organizers of the webinar, namely what are the other possible options for European Union to engage? All who want the fastest establishment of sustainable peace in Ukraine and around Ukraine are waiting for strategic initiatives from the European Union, namely to launch a new daytime policy on the European continent. And secondly, and I'm very glad to hear it from Mr. Melosi, when he mentioned reconciliation potential and experience of European Union. Ukraine needs now as never strategic European Union support for helping to start real effective reconciliation process inside of Ukraine and to start inclusive national dialogue in Ukraine. Next question, can the USA involvement in that conflict bring some added value to solve the, this crisis? This is the last question of the organizer of webinar. Obviously, yes, since the construction of new European oil system without the strategic participation of the United States is practically impossible. In this regard, I am sure we are looking forward to the positive results of the future USA-Russia Geneva Summit on June 16. I would stop here and be ready to answer additional questions. Thanks for your attention. explanation. Um, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Woloshin to directly um, yeah, put forward um, his contribution before we start with the Q&A session. Uh, in the Q&A session, of course, not only participants can ask questions, but also the speakers um, 
among uh, among themselves, you can of course also ask questions and react to each other. But uh, for now, Mr. Voloshin, um, yeah, the, the floor is yours. So sorry. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, I, I'd like to, to express my deep gratitude to you, Julia, for your kind moderation, and also uh, to definitely to Henri Malos, who I believe is a real friend of Ukraine. But what is most important, he is uh, uh, a big fan of a strong Europe with its uh, clear role in uh, in the region, and uh, with its uh, uh, crystal clear position regarding. Ukraine in general and uh, conflict in Donbass. I do believe that Europe should have uh, its own stance on this issue and uh, the deeper Europeans are involved, uh, the better for, for our country and for the speed of the solution of the conflict we discussed today. Uh, definitely, I'm very grateful. I'm very happy to see here uh, honorable diplomats, uh, who some of them I know for, for years, uh, and it's really a very good composition of, of the speakers today. Uh, so um, if I may, uh, a few words, uh, so some my some few specific points that I believe uh, should be raised uh, in this context. Um, uh, is it okay with, with the sound? Uh, oh, yeah, okay, so, thank you. Uh, so uh, first, uh, I, I think that uh, um, one of the biggest mistakes of, of many who do try to have the conflict in Donbass, a smoldering but still bloody conflict in Donbass uh, solved is the focus on, 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 the, on the conflict itself. Uh, taking it outside of the regional and uh, more uh, broader context. Uh, because uh, everyone should agree that the conflict in Donbass uh, doesn't uh, have, or almost have no uh, internal reasons uh, to appear. So it's not a religious conflict, it's not an ethnic conflict, it's not even a conflict arising from the confronting territorial claims of two neighboring states. It's important to stress that, for instance, Moscow at official level, ha level has never denied uh, the uh, um, uh, Ukrainian sovereignty of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Uh, so uh, that's why, uh, unlike many other conflicts that we do have in Europe and worldwide, this one arises uh, from the broader picture. It arises uh, from the general uh, model of relations between Ukraine and Russia, or broader between the West and Russia and the role of Ukraine in these relations. And no, no, uh, no surprise that the, the conflict started right after Maidan. And uh, many here in Kiev tried to artificially uh, uh, discriminate between these two, 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 two events, uh, two, two since they do claim that uh, Crimea and Donbass appeared out of nothing just because out of some territorial claims of Russia towards Ukraine. Well, uh, it would have never happened should Maidan never happen. Uh, so uh, it's not about like uh, now given uh, 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 evaluation whether it was good or bad, but just like just it's, it's good that we are diplomats here, and the diplomats, unlike politicians, need to speak not with slogans but uh, with uh, practicalities because uh, our, we are trained to achieve the result. We are not trained to just formulate the positions, as at least that's how I understand the diplomacy. So we need to bring the result, and and the very fact of the conflict in, Don, on, in Donbass is the evidence symbol of the failure of the diplomacy. Should the diplomacy prevail uh, during the Maidan, including, uh, there would have been no war, there would have been no conflict, definitely. Uh, because again, I stress that inside the Donbass, uh, or even in the relations between Kiev and Moscow themselves, there is no potential for the war. It has never been, and I hope that in the soon, it will soon we achieve the situation and when this uh, potential will never appear again. Uh, we, too much join us and uh, too much make us interdependent. Uh, that's why the, uh, the potential for the conflict uh, comes from the specificity of the relations between Russia and the West uh, after the end of the Cold War. And the, uh, even in, from different uh, approaches towards, towards the uh, results of the Cold War and the, and the uh, ideal model of relations, uh, because definitely, you know, Moscow doesn't recognize the failure, it doesn't recognize the loss in the Cold War. They do claim that Soviet Union just stopped the Cold War, not failed, not, not lost it, and that the West overestimated its, uh, its victories. And they don't even, uh, and uh, they do claim that no great power would ever tolerate an attempt by another great power 
to make a neighboring state a hostile platform to, to of different uh, uh, negative influences coming searching from uh, information and finishing with the military uh, to the neighboring great power. So uh, again, I don't want here to be the devil's own advocate, but uh, a proper understanding of this context uh, makes uh, to everyone easier understanding of the ways how to solve the conflict. Again, if you speak only about Donbass, if you speak, for, if you focus only on the text on the Minsk agreements or uh, like discussions in the, uh, around the Minsk agreements, it's very difficult to understand why uh, anything is not moving ahead. But if you look broader, uh, we can see that it is impossible for Ukraine to solve the conflict in Donbass while at the same time remaining a hostile state towards Russia. So uh, with uh, people in Moscow seeing that whatever they do regarding Donbass will still keep Ukraine as a hostile state, believing that Russia is an enemy and focusing all its national energy on uh, making harm to Russia, they just lose an incentive to help Ukraine solve the conflict in Donbass, as simple as that. So only the general maybe not full, but at least partial normalization of relations between Kyiv and Moscow can ensure uh, the uh, peaceful transition in Donbass. And it will make Russia behave much more constructively and with much more energy uh, towards the solution of the conflict. And uh, a very simple uh, fact. Uh, so I am like, as a member of parliament, I tend to follow the legislation that is adopted on different issues, on taxation, on education, on whatever. And if you look at the text of the documents that have nothing to do with Russia at all, formally, right? That have nothing to do with Donbass, that, that in many cases have nothing to do with national security, that are focused, say, on, on, on education, on, on, on culture, etc. Almost in every text like this, uh, the uh, legislators from the ruling party and from some of the nationalist parties do include the clauses uh, referring to the conflict with Russia, calling, uh, reminding, uh, recalling they as the aggressor state, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they built in Ukrainian legislation that is for years to stand, to stay, right? That is, it has nothing to do with Donbass. That potentially, it will stay after the Donbass conflict is, 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 is solved. They do include the notion that Russia is an enemy. So uh, gradually, in the very fabric of Ukrainian legislation, the notion that Russia is an internal enemy is included. So definitely. Uh, who would in, in Moscow agree to help Ukraine get back control of the territory uh, uh, of part of Ukraine when all of Ukraine uh, will, be, will keep its status as an enemy of Russia? I, I don't believe that any great power will do something like that. I doubt that, say, United States, we have to have the example of Cuba, say, we uh, uh, doubt that anyone will, uh, that the United States will tolerate, uh, say, uh, helping Mexico solve, solve one of its problems given that in Mexico, in Mexico, we still have a government that declares the fight in, a, in different forms against the United States as its principal goal, as, as, a, as a core line of its uh, activity. And that's a big mistake of Mr. Zelensky. He had a chance from the start because he was initially not uh, treated in Moscow as someone who has a big taste for conflict with Russia, vice versa. There was a general understanding that Mr. Zelensky, given his origin, uh, given his uh, background, uh, given uh, his, the team he formed initially, will be very much inclined to uh, not only solve conflict in Donbass, but in general to normalize relations with Russia, say like to renew the air connection with Moscow, to lift some of the economic sanctions, to stop pushing uh, uh, those politicians in Ukraine who speak in support of relations with Russia. Um, again, I cannot but mention the story of Mr. Medvedchuk. It's not because I'm, I belong to this party, but um, uh, our honorable French guests and hopefully others also uh, who, who's, who read the very serious um, uh, French uh, quarterly Politique Internationale uh, might have seen that in the January edition of this magazine, there was an interview with Mr. Medvedchuk. And uh, the editorial board of this very respected uh, magazine uh, did choose the title of the, of the interview, Ukraine Rus Le Go Between. So they called Mr. Medvedchuk as a mediator. So definitely, if uh, you invent a, a reason to put the mediator uh, 
between Kiev and Moscow and, the, in does, in, and did the government of Ukraine. And President Zelensky doesn't deny that he's behind this effort. He openly even boasts that he's behind the effort to uh, remove Medvedchuk from the political scene, even with, uh, putting him, with such method as putting him into jail. So uh, if it happens, what the signal Moscow receives? It receives a signal that uh, Kiev might be willing because of internal reasons because of, uh, of promises of Mr. Zelensky to the people to solve the conflict of Donbass, but is not willing to normalize relations with Russia in general. Uh, so it's not willing to have, to tolerate a democratically elected party in parliament that stands for normalizations of relations with Russia, that consistently stands for a friendly course towards Russia. So receiving the signal, a lot of hawks in Moscow started putting pressure on, on, on Mr. Putin, saying that maybe the uh, attitude towards Ukraine as a country that potentially can become, again, a neutral and uh, normal neighbor of Russia is not valid anymore. Maybe it's a hostile country for years or decades even to come. And if so, why help Ukraine solve any of its problems? Why reverse? If you see the country neighboring you that deliberately chooses to remain hostile, then you do whatever possible to make this country weaker. Uh, again, I'm very open and straightforward with you because we diplomats need to be sometimes. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I really wonder which, in which bring and hat appears this idea to simultaneously try to arrest Mr. Medvedchuk and at the same time request a meeting with Mr. Putin. It's like, say, trying to get a meeting with uh, uh, Mr. Biden and simultaneously to arrest like a bunch of, uh, uh, of activists who do support the implementation of, say, like uh, American or European agenda in Ukraine. Uh, moreover, yesterday there was a conversation between Mr. Yermak and Kozak and other um, uh, diplomatic, presidential, uh, the diplomatic advisors of the leaders of Normandy format. But uh, the absurd part of this story is that uh, during the notorious press conference of the prosecutor general and head of SBU regarding Mr. Medvedchuk, they played during the press conference the alleged recordings of conversations between Mr. Medvedchuk and Mr. Kozak back in 2015. So first, the government uses, uh, not even leaks, but officially uh, the press conference plays some piece of material where the voice of Mr. Kozak allegedly is present. At the same time, wants to, Mr. Kozak to be constructive as negoti at negotiations uh, with Mr. Yermak. So can you imagine someone playing the uh, recordings of conversations between Tori Nuland and Poroshenko, yet so you can they uh, uh, count on some constructive approach on the part of Mr. Mrs. Nuland uh, towards the government of Ukraine? So uh, it's again, it's for us diplomats, it's understandable. You, it's, uh, uh, it's absolutely unnecessary elements of escalation, absolutely unnecessary elements of, uh, of even, I would say, uh, rude behavior that, doesn't con con uh, that don't contribute to the general uh, easing of tensions between Moscow and Kiev. And we have the opposite example, uh, US, the US and Russia. We attentively follow, definitely, I believe, Mr. Charlie and uh, Mr. Ramon and uh, Mr. Malos, we all uh, attentively, definitely Mr. Pfeiffer, uh, we all attentively follow the preparation for the summit. And what is, uh, what is evident for every uh, serious observer? A little taste on the, on the side of Moscow and Washington to aggravate relations before summit happens. Vice the worst, we see a lot of signals coming from Washington and coming from Moscow uh, uh, that uh, stress that both sides are interested in the success of the, of the dialogue. With, uh, for instance, the uh, hacker attack on the colonial pipeline. Two years ago, I believe, a lot of people in Congress would rush to, uh, uh, to point the finger at Russia and to make a big noise around this. However, this time it was Mr. Biden who personally devoted his time in his, uh, in his uh, schedule to stress that Kremlin is not behind that. And it was a signal that uh, Biden administration doesn't want to escalate tensions before very important event. So why put Mitvichuk in prison if you want to have a constructive meeting with Putin? It's just uh, either it's a stupidity or just lack of uh, understanding of elementary uh, diplomatic uh, practices and traditions. Uh, so- uh, Mr. Why, uh, 
Sorry. Yes, yes. Sorry. I, I have to finish. Yes, I have yes. to finish. Yes, yes. yes. Sorry, <laughs> like, sorry. Wrap so, uh, up one, in a minute. <laughs> yeah, one, one last point. I just call upon you, dear colleagues, to uh, what can be the input of, 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 of our European and also American partners. It's uh, definitely you keep sanctions against Russia, a lot of said about that. That's understandable. But there is, there is need to be a push on the side of those who are very uh, experienced in diplomacy, much better experienced than the, than the team of Zelensky, to explain to them that if they do want a result with, to, to be achieved in negotiations with Russia, they need to send at least some signals that might be not liked by radical nationalists inside Ukraine, but we're speaking about foreign policy, not internal policy. We shouldn't make the foreign policy the constant hostage of internal policy calculations. So to send a number of signals to Moscow that in general, should Moscow play a constructive role in solution of the Donbas conflict, Ukraine will go ahead with general normalization, gradual, painful, possibly a long time, but gradual normalization of relations with Russia stopping to be a hostile state to Russia. As simple as that, it's the only opportunity to get Russia on the board of those who really want to solve the conflict in Donbass. Thank you. We had uh, two very different approaches uh, to the question, and therefore I am happy to open the first Q&A session. Um, of course, some of our speakers, you can also ask questions or react. So please use the chat or yes, the, the raising hands function. Okay, so we have a first question. I will just read it out loud because it is in the chat. Um, thank you, Felix, first of all. It seems to me that we are giving a certain consideration to the matters of high politics, but not enough to low politics. In this respect, how can the EU and the US support the local population most affected by the smoldering crisis? So who is to say, if I may, like. <laughs> Yes, please, please go ahead. I think everybody can answer this question, but uh, maybe the first two- I'll try to be very short this time, sorry. Uh, the, big, the big challenge, the big challenge to the general solution of the conflict uh, is that Ukraine has effectively lost its fight with the hands and minds of people in Donbass. And not to the last uh, uh, extent, because uh, the largest part of Donbass, let's not forget it, is controlled by Kiev since 2014. And it hasn't become, unfortunately, a showcase of success, democracy, reform, uh, fight against corruption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, sorry, it's okay? Yes, it's okay. Uh, so, uh, and uh, where, where, where the West can help? It can help, again, to uh, Mariupol, Kramator, Slavyansk, other cities and towns uh, in this area uh, to become a showcase of success and to, at least to disencourage uh, Ukrainian government to cancel local elections in these areas. I should remind you that during the last local elections last autumn, uh, half a million of Ukrainians in these areas under absolutely false pretext were deprived of the right to, to elect their self governance. Uh, we have a military administration that is not, uh, that. Uh, that don't uh, correlate with the will of the people. People just want to have mayors, um, as the leaders of the villages elected by them. Yes, many of them will, be, will come from parties that are in opposition to the government, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, democracy should fail because someone in Kiev dislikes the potential result of the elections. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> to my mind, the diplomacy, this is the art of possible. And to my mind, it's very important now to clearly understand what is possible to do in settlement of Ukrainian crisis in real terms. To my mind, I insist on it. We have to devise strategic level and tactical level. On strategic level till now, we are doing nothing. I expect that after Biden put in meeting, it will be create some possibilities to start strategic dialogue in terms or in framework of European security, or if possible, if one choice, another choice, maybe you and United States and Ukraine 
appeal to special international co conference on Ukraine uh, security umbrella in Europe, like Madrid conference on settlement Palestine Israeli conflict in, in previous century. So it's strategic level. Concerning the tactical level, I'm 100% sure that we have to follow the philosophy of small steps because now we try to implement all provisions of Minsk agreement. But I draw your attention to the fact that what the foreign policy of Zelensky differs from foreign policy of uh, Poroshenko. Poroshenko never put a question about the validity of Minsk agreement. But he not implemented this as Minsk agreement. Uh, in principle, Poroshenko is, uh, Zelensky is more honest as a president. During the last meeting in Normandy format in Paris, for the first time, he put on the discussion the question that Ukraine is not in position to implement some part of Minsk agreement. First of all, the, um, the, some provisions concerning that Ukraine will take control over the border Ukrainian border in eastern part of Ukraine after the election in Donbass. Ukraine position is, is a totally different. And Zelensky demand uh, to renovate the Minsk agreement. So to my mind now, we have a very lack possibility to implement all Minsk agreement as a whole. And especially I draw your attention that latest initiatives compromise initiative from side of France and Germany, which uh, propose um, some new approach to implementation of Minsk agreement, a cluster approach, but the uh, Ukrainian answer very clear, we are not accept this is in principle. And I want to draw your attention that Zelensky uh, needs some real internal restrictions to implement Minsk agreement as a whole, because if he tried to do it very quickly, it creates a great instability inside of Ukraine. So to my mind, now we have to focus on implementation three first provisions of the Minsk agreement, uh, sustainable cease, which can provide for us sustainable ceasefire in the Donetsk region. And in secondly, permit us to, if we reach success in sustainable ceasefire, and we enjoyed some success a few months ago, more than half a year, we have more or less sustainable ceasefire in Donbass. If we manage to implement sustainable ceasefire in Donbass, withdrawal of heavy weapons from the line of fire to stop, uh, to exchange of prisoners of war and some other steps, which provided by the first three points of the Minsk agreement, each permit us to create a very solid foundation for implementation next uh, provisions of the Minsk agreement. To my mind, one of the strategic mistake that we want to implement Minsk agreement as a whole, to my mind, it's now 100% impossible, especially after very clear position of Zelensky that Ukraine now is not considered some provisions of Minsk agreement as valid for Ukraine. So it's a very strong position and it are supported uh, in, inside of Ukraine, especially uh, among the uh, uh, diplomatic elite in Ukraine and all diplomatic environment, internal diplomatic environment around Zelensky very strongly support this position. So to my mind, very important what uh, uh, Mr. Malosi told to start some reconciliation process, not only in Ukraine, but Mr. Voloshin, I, I agree with him that in principle, it's very difficult to imagine that we can't even establish a sustainable ceasefire if in every step we create some problems for bilateral relations between Ukraine and Russia in different spheres. So to my mind, we also need, with help of EU, it's not Normandy format, because I try to be very concrete in answering the question you want to discuss during this webinar. 
we need, this is a German French example of reconciliation, historical reconciliation. It's also very huge experience of EU uh, countries and the EU as a whole to promote this is philosophy, this is a spirit of reconciliation inside Ukraine and around Ukraine. I think this is one of the real mission of EU, especially EU in future set settlement of Ukrainian crisis. And I agree with Mr. Voloshin that it's impossible to try to decide a crisis in Donbass only mm, trying to look at this situation as regional Donbass situation. Only when we uh, try to treat it in more broader context. I stress in my, uh, my address uh, concerning the Crimea uh, challenge. And uh, you know that Zelensky now is another additional new element in his strategic foreign policy. Now he put on the international agenda Crimea as a challenge, as a problem for the whole European security and for bilateral Ukrainian-Russia relation. And he started so-called Crimea platform. And it's a new element. But to my mind, to my mind, uh, I agree we also need to look at a crisis in Donbass through pan-European security order. It's destroyed now, but I have some positive expectation from the future meeting between Biden and Putin. And I waiting for many years more active EU policy from Brussels concerning the dialogue, real dialogue and real data. So uh, I follow very carefully for latest strategic discussion uh, on the uh, uh, summit of EU summit a few days ago concerning the Mr. Shali, may I kindly ask you to, to wrap up too, because we have some more questions and also the other speakers, which I would uh, ask to. Come. I wait from EU strategic policy, some new vision concerning some ideas of new data in Europe, because if Europe only um, um, propose deterrence in Europe as a one in only one instrument to solve situation in Donbass, it's not enough as to me. So I support Macron latest initiatives very strongly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we move to the second block, and no worries for the rest of the questions in the chat, we will come to a EU-Ukraine-Russia trialogue with the OSCE. No, as to me, to find strategic solution, because I think it's question about it. To my mind, the strategic solution possible only in two format options, three format options. Budapest Memorandum option, it's permitted to include in strategic discussion the United States, Great Britain, uh, France now exists, and even China. I think uh, China involvement will be possible for strategic stability in this part of the Europe. It's one format. The next, it's Helsinki to me summit. Uh, because uh, you remember, after the call of Biden to Putin, immediately after it, it was some exchange of ideas between President of Finland and the President of Russia concerning the 2025 uh, new summit of Helsinki. So to my mind, it's a good idea and we have enough time to prepare uh, some strategic idea for new security uh, order in Europe. It's second format. And I mentioned another format. If we create a special security European format only for Ukrainian case as such, as a very strategic in, for European security. Uh, an, an analogy, the Madrid the summit concerning, uh, concerning the Israeli-Palestinian settlement. In this case, it will be open format and every European state will have a right to participate in this format. So to my mind, without, we need some new format, but with very clear differences. What kind of task we want to decide during this format? I think Normandy format and trilateral group, even too much for tactical decisions concerning the ceasefire. Maybe it will be possible to have some special representatives in this format from the United States or from other countries. 
But for strategic questions, we need more new, real new format. On Helsinki 2, special European conference for Ukraine, or we can do it during, within the uh, Budapest memorandum format. Thank you. Mr. Voloshin, what is your short take on the question of Mr. Molos? Um, I just think that uh, it's not about the format, so I would like to continue my line. Uh, that uh, there, is an, there is a need to, to at least outline the general possibility for normalization of relations between Ukraine and Russia in general. Uh, and uh, since there is a lack of will inside Ukraine uh, to go down this path, and even Zelensky, who theoretically, given again his background, uh, uh, had all chances to just uh, uh, impose his will, by the way, on those who oppose uh, the peace process. And it's very easy to be to be done within the framework of our legislation. So if, you, if some radical group just threatened to burn the parliament, should Minsk agreements be like, say, uh, a legislation in the framework of Minsk agreements be voted there, just arrest the leaders of these groups, put them into prison, and that's it. Uh, uh, moreover, we do all know that Avaka and others, we know the names of those who sponsor these radical groups. So if there is a will, there is a way. There is all, we should, you, uh, uh, all of Europe shouldn't be a hostage of radicals who just don't want any reconciliation with Russia. If they don't want peace, they go to prison. Very simple. Uh, so, but uh, since there is lack of lack of will, that then I rely on the say like on the on the big leaders. Uh, um, if uh, U.S. and Russia find some come, some way together. It doesn't mean everyone understands that there are a lot of discrepancies are there to stay. But what is what what we all expect from Geneva meeting is a general signal that no more uh, Mr. Biden wakes up in the morning thinking how to harm Russia, and no more Mr. Putin wakes up in the morning thinking to how to harm the U.S. As soon as this happens, uh, it will uh, uh, all of radicals who are against reconciliation with Russia and Ukraine will lose the, the, the feeling that they do something that is liked by the West. Uh, and uh, that, that's as simple as that. That's what we expect from the meeting in Geneva. Dave, thank you. Thank you very much. And now it is my great pleasure and um, yeah, also honor to invite uh, Mr. Vimont, Ambassador Vimont, the, the stage is yours. Thank you for your distinguished take on the situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all, and um, I thank uh, Vocal Europe for organizing this um, uh, this discussion, which I think is quite interesting. And I'm I'm very happy to be here also to listen to your um, um, to the dig distinguished uh, Ukrainian members of this uh, of this panel, because I think we we learn a lot by simply listening to what the um, our Ukrainian friends have to say. You know. The question you have put is how can the EU help? Um, what are the opportunities for the EU to help uh, find a solution with this uh, ongoing confrontation? And of course, the EU can help. Uh, um, it can uh, give some advice, but it cannot impose a solution. The solution at the end of the day is for the Ukrainian leaders, for the Ukrainian people to find a, a, a solution. And I think it's always important to remind this. Um, the solution is in Ukraine, <laughs> I think nowhere else. Um, we, there are a lot of problems, of course, with all the neighbors on the different uh, borders of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, but the road for a solution still remains in, 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 in Ukraine. Now, the big question I understand that comes out of the first part of the discussion we have just heard um, is for me the um, how to accommodate the long, the long game, the long term policy, and I would say the, the short term um, uh, measures and decisions that can be taken. And we've heard very interesting ideas put on the table. Uh, but there was, I think, this idea that uh, we couldn't do both, uh, that to some extent uh, we needed a strategic approach in order to move, uh, to move forward. Uh, and I think to some extent it's right. Uh, and diplomacy has learned to, has helped us to learn uh, 
from a long history of conferences uh, uh, during many centuries, uh, that if you want to succeed in getting an agreement, you need to have an understanding of what the broad picture is and what the long-term picture is all about. But at the same time, if you rely only on the long-term strategy, quite often you go nowhere uh, because you need a clear understanding of how to implement this long-term strategy um, and how to uh, put it into motion. And, and there you need you know, incremental, pragmatic, progressive approach there. Uh, um, and this is where we are with regard to Ukraine. You have the Minsk agreements of 2014 and 2015 with all the different formats that have been set up, the Normandy format, the trilateral contact group. Um, and these are tools that were set up to try to bring in ceasefire, confidence building measure, and that is important. Um, to suddenly decide to drop all of this and to leave it aside uh, in order to reach um, a strategic uh, understanding and a long-term agreement uh, on what should be European security, it is of course necessary. But if you go only for that, uh, then you will lose the pragmatic approach and maybe you will lose something and not win anything on the other side. Because let's be honest, what is missing at the moment uh, between Russia on one side, Ukraine and the EU and the United States on the other side is, um, is uh, an, an inability uh, to agree on what is the long-term goal. Um, what is the kind of European stability we would like to reach? How to do this? Uh, how to create some sort of security order in, in Europe that will bring security and stability and prosperity among all of us. We have the OSCE, we have the Helsinki agreements from 1975, we have the Paris, Paris Charter from 1990, which reaffirm all those principles. But the reality is that what we have witnessed for the last 10 or 20 years has been some sort of crumbling um, of uh, those principles, of those values. Um, and it is how the whole question now is how do we rebuild uh, that kind of, uh, of security order uh, that has been to a very large extent dismantled um, and uh, left out um, of the, uh, the situation as it stands today. And this is what we need to do. Now, should we bring in, uh, as it was said, um, uh, China, the P5, and many others? I'm not so sure that the format is really what it's all about. Um, it seems to me that we have plenty of um, places where this can be discussed. I was talking about the OSCE. Uh, uh, one could put forward the um, NATO-Russia Council that exists now for 20 years and it's not very much used. Um, uh, we can have um, plenty of those places where we could work. Um, um, the whole question is, do we have a clear idea of the kind of long-term goal we want to reach? And at the moment, I think um, the, um, uh, the um, uh, the mindset is not ripe, let's be honest. Uh, with uh, the most recent incidents with regard to Belarus, um, with the um, tit for tat sanctions, counter sanctions that are taking place, uh, we know very well that we are far away from having a sort of common goal that we want to reach for. In order to uh, reach that goal, um, we need precisely to look at the kind of day-by-day uh, -day pragmatic steps that we can take in order to rebuild some sort of confidence that would allow for a discussion on the long-term objective that we want to reach. It's what diplomacy is all about. It's being able to be very firm on one side and to launch a dialogue on the other side. Um, it's about this. And at the moment, in my opinion, the European Union is not exactly in the proper position, the relevant position to engage that kind of long-term dialogue with Russia. 
We have seen it with uh, the recent Joseph Borrell's visit to Moscow. Um, he was eager to launch that kind of dialogue and he had no response. <laughs> if only one that was closing the door um, and refusing to have a dialogue with the European Union at that stage. So I think for the European Union, it's about rebuilding that kind of strong position that will make it a relevant player and, and a relevant interlocutor for the Russian side. As long as you don't have that, I don't think you can start thinking about a long-term strategy discussion, strategic discussion with Russia. You need to improve your act, not only on Ukraine, but also uh, in the other Eastern partners countries, um, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, um, uh, for the time being, I see no possibility of moving anywhere with Belarus. So let's keep on having a firm position there. And let's hope that as time goes by, we will manage to uh, improve our uh, position with regard to Russia. I think this is how you build a strong diplomatic stance and a strong diplomatic position. With regard to Ukraine, it seems to me that we, we have to work with what we've got. We've got a free trade agreement, we have an association agreement, we have plenty uh, of uh, potential for a strong cooperation with Ukraine and trying to advise Ukraine on how to move and improve its act in terms of economic reform, uh, rule of law, uh, the fight against corruption, so on and so forth. This is where Europe can be helpful. And I think this is important because Ukraine and Ukrainian leaders have to understand how the outside world is looking at their country. It's about how to convince foreign investors to invest in Ukraine and to come back there and to improve uh, Ukrainian economy. Uh, by improving Ukrainian economy and making out of uh, Ukraine um, uh, prosperity a sort of a template and model, um, we can certainly put ourselves in a better position when we confront Russia and when we discuss with Russia. And with regard to the Minsk um, uh, process, once again, I wouldn't disregard it. It may be not um, uh, performing very well at the moment, of course, uh, because we need to, to tango. Uh, but yet, there are plenty of ammunitions there. There are plenty of uh, topics on which we can discuss. Um, ceasefire implementation. Um, um, exchange of prisoners, uh, opening new openings of uh, the border between Donbass and the rest of the country, um, so on and, and, and so forth. Um, and I think we have to go on with that. Uh, should we enlarge the um, uh, Normandy format? I don't know. Uh, I think at some point the French and the Germans were open to that, but uh, most of our Western partners were not all that interested into uh, getting involved into this. Um, so I think um, we have to um, act in a very pragmatic way there. Once again, diplomacy is about joining the two elements of the short term and the long term. You need to have a clear idea where you want to go in the long term, but then you have to act in implementing this on a state, um, stage by stage approach. If you go directly for an international conference on, on Ukraine, what you will hear is the traditional bickering and confrontation and not much will come out of this. Uh, if you want an international conference, this has to be well prepared and it has to be prepared on the ground. And you have to put yourself in a strong position to start that kind of long-term negotiation. Julia, I'll stop there for the time being because I've been quite too long already. Sorry. Not at all. Thank you very much, Ambassador Vivon. It was uh, perfectly fine, no worries. So thank you very much uh, for your contribution. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Ambassador Pfeiffer. Um, yeah, welcome to you and thank you. Well, thank you very much for taking part here um, in the invitation. Uh, let me begin by talking about what does Russia want, <laughs> because I think a big part of this solution is going to be decided in Moscow. 
And without that, uh, I'm not sure Donbass is resolvable. I think ideally what Russia wants, you know, they want Ukraine back in Moscow's sphere of influence. That means a friendly government in Kyiv. It means a Ukraine open to Russian business. And it means that Ukraine would defer to Moscow on big geopolitical issues. That includes Ukraine's relationship with NATO and the European Union. And I would argue that right now, at least watching from outside, that seems unlikely. And that seems unlikely because of Russian actions over the past seven years. And I agree with Mr. Voloshin, uh, I think a segment of Ukraine is hostile towards Russia. And that should not be a surprise when Russia used military force to seize Crimea. And then when Russian security and military forces instigated and then have sustained a conflict in Donbass, which has claimed almost 14,000 Ukrainian lives. And if Russian-Ukraine relations now are difficult, and if normalization of those relations appears hard, I think that problem lies primarily in Moscow and decisions taken by the Kremlin. Uh, those decisions have had the effect of pushing Ukraine away from Russia and towards the West. What I think the Kremlin now seeks is basically uh, looking for ways to use Donbass as a mechanism to pressure and destabilize the government in Kyiv and to make it harder for that government to do what it needs to do to reform and build a strong Ukraine and draw closer to Europe. Because the Kremlin does not want, at this point, a successful Ukraine. And by successful, I mean a Ukraine that not only has a pluralistic democratic system, but has a strong economy that is contributing to higher standards of living to its people. And the Kremlin fears that kind of uh, Ukraine because that's a threat to the Kremlin in that it would cause Russians to ask, why can't they have the same political space that Ukrainians do? So I think this is a complication of the conflict in Donbass. That conflict is not just about Ukraine. It's not just about geopolitics. It's not about spheres of influence, but it's also very much about Russian domestic politics and even the Kremlin's regime survival. Now, the Kremlin thus far appears to be quite content with a simmering conflict in Donbass. It's by no means frozen. They can ratchet up as we saw in April. They can also ratchet it back down like we saw last summer. Uh, but the effort here is to keep Kiev off balance. And again, at this point in time, it's hard to see that the Kremlin is ready to resolve Donbass. At least they're not prepared to resolve Donbass on terms that would be acceptable to Ukraine. Uh, I suspect that what the Russian goal actually is, is something like Dmitry Kozak, who is now has the lead on Ukraine within the Kremlin, like he attempted back in 2003 between Transnistria and Moldova, where a proposal that would basically reintegrate Donbass back into Ukraine, but under terms where Donbass could veto national decisions in Kyiv, uh, such as how it aligned with the West and such. And I don't think Ukraine is prepared to accept that kind of poison pill, and it shouldn't. And I don't believe either the United States or the European Union would press Ukraine to do that. So I think at this point, you know, Ukraine can't resolve Donbass unless Moscow is prepared to do that. Uh, as for Germany and France, as the uh, leaders of the Normandy process, uh, I think they've had a very difficult and often, often thankless task. But I would argue that you should maintain the Minsk II format until you come up with something better to replace it. Uh, from Ukraine's perspective, among other things, Minsk II is the basis for European Union sanctions. And if you were to wipe that away and replace it with some new format, you need to figure how do you sustain those sanctions, because I think they are important uh, to Ukraine's effort to change uh, the thinking in Moscow. Uh, but again, I think that's the question for the European Union and for the West, how do you, and for Ukraine, how do you change that calculation in the Kremlin of the costs and benefits? I do think that Donbass may be subject to a solution in the way that Crimea is going to be much more difficult. You know, the Russians have offered passports uh, in, in, in Donbass, but that may well be just a pretext for uh, creating action in the future. But it's hard to see other signs that suggest they would want to annex that area. And I think part of the reason is the rehabilitation of Donbass is going to be expensive, tens of billions of dollars that Moscow does not want to pay. And the productive workforce has largely left. So the economy in that area is going to be very difficult. Uh, so at this point, I think there's a chance to negotiate on Donbass in a way that perhaps is not evident on Crimea. But looking at the European Union, the question is, can the Europeans sustain the unity that has had uh, regarding Ukraine over the past seven years, including on sanctions, which I think most people in Washington would not have predicted? You know, but there will be, I think, some uh, within the union who want to seek a return to business as usual. 
Uh, the question is, can that be sustained, including after Chancellor Merkel departs the scene this fall? Uh, I think her leadership has been very important uh, to keeping the European Union united in its policy. A and whoever becomes the chancellor in Berlin after September is not going to have her background, her expertise, her relationship with Putin, and perhaps not her interest. So I think that's one issue here, is how does the EU sustain the approach it's had over the last seven years? But how do we get a change in Kremlin policy? And we've seen over the last year, seven years, efforts to use the whole set of tools to try. The European Union and the United States tried to raise costs to, uh, to Russia by political isolation, but that fairly quickly crumbled and I can't see it really being restored. There are sanctions. Uh, I think the sanctions actually have had a significant impact on Russia. One estimate I've seen is that uh, it costs the Russian economy about 1% of gross domestic product per year. And in a stagnant economy that's growing at only one and a half percent per year, you know, that's a major impact. Moreover, um, more sanctions could be possible. Uh, I think I talked to somebody, a former sanctions are in America who says on a scale of one to 10, Western sanctions at this point are only at about a three. Uh, and we saw, for example, last year or two years ago, uh, how certain sanctions on state-owned enterprises can have a big impact. You know, what the sanctions did to Rusol, it wiped 40% of the market value on the stock market off the market in four hours time, although they had not calculated the knock-on effects to the broader aluminum industry in the worldwide and then had to walk some of that back. So I think there are sanctions out there that could dramatically raise the cost of Moscow, but I have little sense that there's much enthusiasm within Europe for that. And I'm not sure in America how much enthusiasm there's for more sanctions. There's all the question of military assistance, but that's really been the purview of the United States and individual NATO allies as a way to bolster Ukraine's military ability to resist Russian aggression, but also as a means to signal political support. But again, I suspect that there's not a lot of appetite among EU countries for that kind of military assistance. So when you look at other tools, you know, it, it's hard to see what other tools are available that can affect the thinking in Moscow. Now, does the Biden presidency represent an, an opportunity? I, I think in President Biden, you have somebody who knows Ukraine. He visited Ukraine six times as vice president. He understands the Russian challenge. And he also understands that tough problems like Donbass are going to take time and process to resolve. So my own expectation is that if an opportunity were to emerge where it would appear that high level US engagement might help break the stalemate over Donbass, I believe the White House would consider that. And, but I would expect that that would be an effort to support the German and the French effort in Norm the Normandy process, not displace them. And U.S. involvement might, in fact, make sense. And here I agree with uh, Alexander Chali. Uh, Don Paz is not just about internal issues. It's also about geopolitics. And I agree with him. I'm not sure that Russia would be prepared to settle Donbass without some understanding of where Ukraine fits into Europe geopolitically. And it's hard to imagine that conversation, that discussion happening without the United States at the table. But at this point, it's very difficult to see the kind of opportunity or opening that would make sense for the US to engage. Now, when Presidents Biden and Putin meet uh, next month, I, I think President Biden, or at least I hope he'll do three sets of issues. One, draw red lines for the Russians, make clear those things that from the American point of view will result in sanctions and pushback. Second, explore those areas, arms control, for example, where interests coincide and some kind of cooperation may be possible. But third, begin to talk about the really tough questions. And I think the questions that will have to be solved if you ever want to normalize US-Russia relations. And I think Ukraine would be at the top of that list. But I, for this first meeting, I think it's important to keep expectations very, very modest. So I think for the time being, I think the West is going to be in a position uh, where it should be continuing to support Ukraine. Uh, here, I might very much agree with Ambassador Ramon. It's also going to be important for the West to push Ukraine on domestic reform, because while Russia can veto a solution on Donbass, Ukraine has its own power to do domestic reform, uh, fight corruption, and take the steps that would build a stronger, more robust Ukrainian state that would both raise living standards for Ukrainians, but also would position Ukraine better to withstand Russian pressure. Uh, and then hope that we can help you sustain Ukraine until such time as uh, basically we're seeking to outweigh Russia and get to a point where Russia will change its approach. I wish I had some brilliant uh, creative policy proposal, um, but I think uh, you know, our options at this point are pretty limited.
So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Ambassador Pfeiffer. Um, I will not lose uh, that much time because we have uh, six questions already in the chat. And uh, I think everybody is keen on uh, hearing, on listening to your, your answers. I will just read them out. So the first one is from Violetta. First of all, thank you for asking the question. Um, she says, Ukraine is a sovereign country and like Russia, its government does what it believes best for its population and future. Resigning to, re to maintain a positive relationship with Russia without getting anything in return seems unlikely. Would Russia commit to respecting the wishes of the Ukrainians for their future? Interests, oops, now I lost the questions. Interests are always present. The future of Russians should be in Russian hands as well as any country in the world. In addition to this, adding to the Normandy Quartet, the presence of the High Representative of the EU would help in any way to move forward in the conflict resolution, or rather not in the opposite. So, yeah, I just would give the floor to the person who would like to uh, engage and answer to that question or provide an answer. Mr. Shali, we cannot hear you. You have, yes, great. Because, yeah. Thanks. Look, concerning this question, look, it's a very legitimate question. And Russia have to respect the will of Ukrainian people, the will of Ukrainian nation. It's obvious. But exists another very difficult question. And no one in Ukraine is ready to give answer on this question. But to the contrary, Ukraine also have international obligation to respect will of Russian people and Russian nation, especially in security sphere, because Paris Charter and OSCE uh, document, documents of high level documents, all of them establish not only free right of every state to choose security mode, but also the responsibility of all individual state for indivisibility of European security. So to my mind, we need that. And to my mind, it's a very interesting point. Ambassador Remo are talking that key in Kiev. Ambassador Pfeiffer is talking key in Moscow for decision crisis. To my mind, key in Brussels, in Kyiv, in Moscow, and in Washington, because there are four real reasons for Ukrainian crisis. This is geopolitical rivals between NATO, United States, and Russia, geoeconomic rivals between EU, Russia, over Ukraine, our our contradictions, our post-colonial conflict in relationship between Moscow and Kyiv, and our internal conflict, because Donbass case was only possible because some internal conflict inside of Ukraine. So we very strongly need reconciliation philosophy now, inside of country, outside of country. And to my mind, we can to decide Ukrainian crisis only if we find solutions or find response for all these four challenges. But till now, my point, I agree that philosophy of small steps now prevail. But I want to draw your attention to start to speak strategically and to involve other dimensions which necessary to find response for these challenges to regulate Ukrainian crisis. And in this new dimensions, I see a very critical role of United States and EU as such. And to my mind, I expect that Biden-Putin meeting will be like Reagan-Gorbachev meeting in Geneva. It will be first step in the long road for new detente. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shelley. Yes, Ambassador Vimo? Yes. Um... I, I totally agree. And at the same time, we all have to admit um, that how to reconcile these op op opposing views between Russia on one side 
um, EU and US position on the other side about the stability of the European security order um, is, a major, is a major issue that is not easy to settle quickly. Um, uh, Agree. To go, to go for, uh, to go for uh, directly answering the question of Ukrainian membership to NATO or to the European Union will only feed uh, the confrontation furthermore, as we all know. Uh, and certainly, and I'm the first one that would agree with this, it is for the Ukrainian people to decide uh, about their membership to NATO and the EU in the future. Uh, but even from the EU point of view, a time may be not ripe for the moment to start discussing this kind of membership. So while at the same time we need to have this ongoing discussion about the future of the uh, European security, I think we also need to move at the same time on today, the day-to-day -day approach. Um, it goes hand in hand. You need to walk on both feet, um, on both legs. If you, if you just wait for a solution on the long-term problem of European security order, you will go nowhere uh, because it will take a long time to reach that. And in the meantime, the um, ongoing confrontation on the ground, the lack of ceasefire will remain. So it's a step-by-step -step approach. Um, if the meeting in Geneva between President Biden and President Putin helps to lower the temperature <laughs> and to create some sort of a, a background to start a discussion on strategic matter, that will be for the best. Uh, we will all agree it will be for the better uh, and we should all go along with this. Um, but it shouldn't uh, prevent us of trying to look also at uh, what is going on on the ground in Ukraine. You need to do both. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, Ambassador Pfeiffer, did you want to uh, say something? If not, then I would jump to the next question. Yeah, I think just two quick comments. Um, yes, sure. We'll see what happens in Geneva. Again, I, I think just given the very difficult relationship between Washington and Moscow, uh, my expectations for that meeting are pretty modest. I, it may start a process, but I think it's going to be a, a long, slow process. Uh, and I would agree with that, Ambassador Mohn that I think it's important to work on the pragmatic steps on the ground, even while thinking, you know, you know what's, what are the other pieces of the solution, including geopolitical? And for example, you know, some questions you may just want to kick down the road. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the question of Ukraine's relationship with NATO, I took part in a track two conversation a few years ago with Ukrainians and Russians, and the answer that we came up with was Ukraine's membership in NATO, not now, but not never. I mean, some questions you may want to diplomatically put down the road, uh, because at this point in time, they may simply be too difficult to resolve. Thanks. Um, then I will just move forward with the next question because we have so many uh, great questions in the chat. Um, so one question is on Nord Stream 2. In the past week, the Biden administration decided to waive sanctions targeting the Nord Stream 2 AG and important figures within that company. Opponents of the pipeline project um, tied closely to Ukrainian security. In 2004, the gas transit contracts between Russia and the Ukraine and Ukraine are set to expire. What should and could to be done related to Nord Stream 2, or is it the discussion of Nord Stream 2 and Ukrainian security an exaggerated one? What? I would just uh, read out the question again. Uh, what should and could be done related to Nord Stream 2, or is this connection, the discussion on Nord Stream 2 in connection with Ukrainian security, is that an exaggerated one to connect both discussions? Okay, if you permit, to my mind, it's obvious that Nord Stream 2 will be finished as a project. Of course, it creates a challenge for Ukraine transit of Russian gas, but to my mind, even after the Nord Stream will be in function, the Ukrainian route will be more econom economically 
better than Nord Stream for some delivery of gas from Russia to Europe. It's the first. And second, I very strongly support the idea of Ambassador Ischinger, the head of Munich uh, Security Conference, that, and as I see, it's a deal now between Germany and United States, Merkel-Biden deal, that, okay, Nord Stream will be operated, but how it, it, uh, its uh, Nord Stream will be operated? We can regulate special regime of delivering gas on this route. To my mind, in this future special regime of using Nord Stream 2, we have to respect the Ukrainian rights. So I very strongly support such approach. We cannot hear you, Ambassador Pfeiffer. Yes. Let me step in quickly. Yeah. Um, just to go along and maybe go a little bit further um, uh, with what um, uh, the Vice Chair just said, uh, Mr. Chelly. Um, I think um, we have to accept the fact that Nord Stream 2 will be finished, if only for economic reasons. When you're talking about a project that is now built for nearly 95% of the total, uh, you just can't drop it like that. Um, it would create too many economic and financial havoc uh, uh, for many enterprises. But what you can do is to look at the uh, um, fallout of, uh, of this uh, Nord Stream 2 project and to look at it from the perspective of the Ukrainian economy and precisely go um, for uh, in the energy sectors on the way to improve the Ukrainian position now that we admit that Nord Stream 2 will be finished. Um, we are facing a moment of a total transformation of the energy market around Europe uh, because of the Green Deal, because of the uh, moving away from some energy resources to other new resources. And from that point of view, the EU could play a very useful role in cooperating with Ukraine to help the Ukrainian economy to adapt to that transformation in terms of uh, gas storage for the regional partners um, to Ukraine, in terms of, uh, of looking at the next generation of uh, energy sources, so on and so forth. This is typically the kind of cooperation, updated cooperation that we could work with Ukraine and would be of mutual benefit, both for the EU and for Ukraine. Rather than going on with this endless um, uh, discussion about should we stop or not a Nord Stream 2, let's move to the next stage. That seems to me the real important thing to do. Um. If I may make a short contribution. Yes, I, I think Ambassador Pfeiffer wanted to speak up first, right? Ah, sorry. Yeah, no, just say, I mean, I, I think Washington opposes Nord Stream 2, but Washington does not want to get in a big fight with Berlin and with Europe about it, so we'll, we'll not use sanctions to block it. But I think there's a hope in Washington and also something of an expectation, though, that as part of this arrangement, that, that Berlin might take the lead in defining some uh, ways to assist Ukraine which will be the big loser when Nord Stream 2 begins to operate, uh, either in extending the existing contract that it would put some gas through Ukraine or finding some other ways to strengthen Ukraine's energy situation. And I think that discussion is still taking place and I look to whatever conversations will take place between President uh, Biden and Chancellor Merkel on the margins of either the G7 or the NATO summits in June to see if there's uh, some sort of a uh, arrangement on that part. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just uh, before I give the floor back to Mr. Woloshin, who wants to react as well. Um, we have almost uh, 1230. So I would love to continue uh, to exchange uh, with all of you. So I would like to ask our speakers, do you still have some time? Do you still have 10 minutes to no, Mr. Bimo, yeah. have you? I have. <laughs> you, you have or you haven't? I have, I have. Mr. Chow, I have. <laughs> Mr. Shelley has, Mr. Pfeiffer? I, I could do 10 more minutes, but not longer than that. Okay, 10 more minutes, uh, Ambassador de Vimont? Uh, yes, maybe I can try, but uh, I may leave you before the end, so I apologize. Uh, but please go on with the discussion anyway. Uh, if I'm not there, it doesn't matter. 
well, uh, it, it does. If I may, like, just very short, because I would like to support the point made by Mr. Rimon. Um, and uh, as I, uh, it was really constructive discussion, a lot of things to think so, so over. Um, uh, the Nostrum 2 uh, is a very, um, it's a benchmark. Uh, because I fully agree with what uh, Ambassador Mimon said. We should stop continuously talking about how to disrupt something that is done by Russia. Like or dislike, but Russia did show its uh, capability. It has breached the Crimean bridge. Uh, it has built the Nord Stream 2. It, by the way, what is not discussed because uh, Zelensky very much likes Erdogan, uh, but uh, they have also built the Turkish stream that is also a threat to Ukrainian uh, transit. And, uh, and what did Ukraine over the what did two uh, presidents of Ukraine after another in, in, in terms of infrastructure? Nothing. They haven't built any anything that could prove that Ukrainian gas transportation system uh, is much better or much more compatible. And uh, I'm sure that uh, if tomorrow, like I mean tomorrow, but if on the 16th of June, uh, President Biden raises the issue with, with Mr. Putin, I believe the answer from him will be yes, Russia can guarantee the continuation of transit of gas through Ukraine on commercial terms, if Ukraine is not hoping to use its uh, pipeline as an instrument to somehow influence Russia politically, very simple. So we have a seller, we have a buyer, so we have Russia, we have European Union, and I have a transit nation. And to ensure the system work, all three need to, 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 to come to terms with each other. Ne neither of them needs to be hostile because, um, uh, why should uh, German households be dependent whether they have heating or not in winter because Ukraine has some problems with Russia, because someone in Ukraine is offended because of Crimea. I can understand Germans. They just want to, uh, to guarantee that their households get heating in the winter, Doesn't uh, no matter what happens in Ukraine. So the only way to guarantee that Ukraine keeps transit, and it's not only about gas, it's also billions that can potentially come from Eurasian trade uh, should uh, all most of this trade comes through, through from China, through Russia, and then through Ukraine to European Union. So Ukraine geographically is positioned ideally to benefit from from transit, but to do it, we need again to reconcile with Russia. We cannot afford, as it was a very simple point of our party, and that is supported by millions in Ukraine. We just cannot afford the conflict with Russia. It's too expensive to have conflict with Russia. Very simple. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Then I would like to ask now our speakers for some concluding remarks, uh, if you wanted to, because then we already have to wrap up um, this very interesting exchange. I'm really sorry that we could not uh, find answers to all the great questions that we still have in the chat, but unfortunately our time is up. And yes, first of all, I would like to thank everybody as well to, to have joined us. And I would now give the floor to our guest speakers again for some yeah, final statements and for some wrapping up. Um, okay, I, I start my final statement. It will be very short. I'm very impressed of our discussion, very high quality, very open minded approaches. What I want only to tell very honestly, my perception of the future of the Ukrainian crisis. I agree that uh, uh, construction or reconstruction or reconfirmation of the new European order, it's a long process, but I am optimist that maybe it will be finished in 2025, in four years. I think it's possible. It's the first. Second, but at the same time, we need a small philosophy steps uh, concerning the first of all, stop of ceasefire on the uh, line of division in Donbass now. We have a good experience, successful experience, previous six months. Unfortunately, now we enjoy, we, we met a, a great escalation, but now we in the escalating period, and I think we need urgent steps to de-escalate conflict and transfer this conflict in the uh, stage it will be uh, six months ago as a stable ceasefire. So, to my mind, if we are not in position uh, to see the general architecture of European security, I think the only one possible way, real possible way, to stop 
to kill each other in eastern part of Ukraine, it's to frozen this conflict. The best solution to transfer this conflict in status in Transnistria, where they not kill each other last 27 years. And uh, now we uh, see some uh, con confidence uh, between the Trans uh, Tiraspol uh, people and uh, Kishinev people. So to my mind, it's only one way to stabilize the conflict because this conflict caused too much for Ukrainian reforms. Without the stabilization of roles in this conflict, I think it will be very difficult for Ukraine to be successful in internal reforms. And next question, how to persuade Russia? It was the key question for me in Washington in 2014. Why Russia agreed to frozen in this conflict? To my mind, we need new diplomacy to persuade Russia to implement 100% three first steps of Minsk agreement. Of course, we need the same steps, very strong steps from the Ukrainian side. So to my mind, I think we need more practical and more balanced approach from Brussels and Washington concerning the strategic implementation of the Ukrainian government, what to do, uh, what you expect from the Ukrainian government, from the Ukrainian president in, in, in settlement of this conflict in the next uh, three, four years. And uh, now in Kyiv, many, many people uh, looking with some positive expectation for future Biden Putin meeting. I stress it once more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelley. Mr. Voloshin? Okay, then I would now give the floor to uh, Mr. to Ambassador Vimon because you have to leave very quickly, as I understand. <laughs> Sorry again. Um, no. <laughs> um, I think Ambassador Pfeiffer was saying um, in his uh, contribution um, that at the end of the day, the problem was, uh, was about Russia. Uh, and I think to a, a very large extent, he's right. Uh, I would maybe put it in a different way, uh, but I think I would agree with him. It's, it, it's about this uh, area of uh, conflicting influence and in what the Europeans call their Eastern partnership. And it's about European Union neighborhood and about the fact that we have conflicting views with Russia on this part of the European continent. Uh, and, and in order to overcome this, these conflicting views, uh, Europeans need to have a clear idea about what they want to have and what they want to do in that area. Um, uh, they have to accept that they have responsibilities there. And maybe going back to what Henri Malos was saying at the beginning, if Europe wants to apply um, in that part of the European continent, its recipe of, um, of uh, de-escalation, reconciliation, peace, in fact. This is what it's all about. Uh, what I heard, I think, the other day, Alain Lamassour, a former member of the European Parliament, talking about the EU miracle of peace. Um, if we want to use that recipe and this toolbox of reconciliation, we need to start quickly um, and try to get a clear idea about where we want to go with this combination of firmness and dialogue I was talking about a, a few minutes ago. Um, and I think um, the European Union still has some homework to do. Um, uh, and if it's able to do its homework, it will be able to apply it to Ukraine as it will be uh, able to apply it to our other partners in this part of the European continent. And this is really the best contribution Europe can bring. It's to clear up its mind and have a better understanding of what it wants to do. I don't think we have it at the moment yet. Um, and that's the, uh, uh, the work we need to do for, for the months ahead. I'll stop there and I thank you. And I apologize in advance if I leave you before the end. Thank, thank you. you very much for standing for staying a bit uh, longer with us and thank you for your contributions. Um, then I would like to give the floor now to Ambassador Pfeiffer for his uh, concluding remarks.
Uh, thanks very much. Let me just make three quick points. So uh, one is I, I would agree with Ambassador Charlie that um, if you could stabilize the ceasefire and get back to the situation that existed between August and December of last year, that would be a positive development. Um, I, I, I hope that it doesn't become a frozen conflict with the length of Transnistria, but I suspect this is going to be a long-term issue, uh, in part because I still, I think the key is at the end of the day, is Russia prepared for a settlement? And I don't think the Russians are at this point. Second point on normalization of Ukraine's relationship with Russia, uh, that's for Ukrainians to decide. Uh, but the Ukrainians are going to have to ask is the price that Ukraine will have to pay for that normalization, is that a price that Ukraine is uh, prepared to pay both in terms of how it would require Ukraine restructuring domestic politics, but also how it would require Ukraine to uh, pursue its, uh, its foreign policy. Uh, and third, uh, if um, the Ukrainians conclude that that price is in fact too high, uh, I hope and expect that the United States and the European Union will continue the kind of support that they provided to Ukraine over the last seven years. I'll end at that point. Thank you very much, Ambassador Pfeiffer. And uh, yes, please, Mr. Woloshin. Uh, yeah, thank yeah. you very much, Julia. Uh, so again, a very short few points. First, uh, the thing that we lack more this time uh, it's the most uh, unsustainable position to believe that we, we can sit and wait till Russia changes behavior. We already have a generation of children who went to school in Donbass who don't know what Ukraine is. So we don't have time, actually. Uh, to, we need to deal with Russia as it is today. Second, uh, in fact, there is nothing, nothing at all uh, coming from Russia that can uh, hinder Ukrainian development regarding uh, internal economic reforms, fight against corruption, etc., etc., etc. So uh, no one in Russia has a taste to influence uh, whether Ukraine builds uh, I I its country according to the model of Poland, Hungary, Germany, Somalia, whatever. But what Russia has legitimate reason to be concerned is that Ukraine not to become a, a bulwark of uh, malign uh, and especially uh, military uh, influence on its territory. So from this standpoint, I can assure you that NATO membership of, U of Ukraine is closed for years to come if we don't want just an open conflict with Russia again. So as simple as that. And the last point, uh, very important. I do believe uh, that uh, Ukraine can become economically prosperous and uh, stable only if it opens up its transit status. And to open up its transit status is really uniquely geographically situated between East and West and it should be a bridge and not a war between East and West. It needs to rebuild relations with Russia and further to be rebuilt relations with China that they know now also in tatters. And uh, from this, Ukraine will become much richer, much more stable and much more democratic than keeping hostile relations with Russia. Finland during the Cold War is a good example how a country can develop being democratic, Western in its model, but keeping good relations with Eastern Bloc. Thank you. Mr. Molos, the stage is yours for some concluding remarks. Yes, uh, of course, I will first of all, uh, thanks a lot to all the distinguished speakers and uh, the participants. Um, I would just say to finish, but uh, some people would like to move Ukraine, some to the west, some to the east. But Ukraine is uh, where it is uh, with its neighbors, but he has it, this will never change. So we have to accept that. Uh, and we have to accept that and we have to consider, as I say once in the European Council, that you cannot ask someone to choose between uh, uh, its uh, father or its, uh, its mother. Uh, the history is there. Uh, the Ukrainian society is complex. We have to take it in account. Now, now the question is that uh, if we want to have a strong a uh, strong Ukraine, and I was very impressed by the last remark of uh, um, Oleg Borodchin about the example of Finland. If you want to have a strong, strong Ukraine, we have a, to have a strong economic and, and social Ukraine, sustainable. And for what you see today, someone mentioned the, what Pierre Vimont, the investment, the development, economic development. Today, it's 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 not possible because of the tensions, internal tensions, and the war. Who will invest in a country which is in the, in the state of, uh, of war? Uh, and I see a lot of uh, French or European investors who hesitate a lot to go to Ukraine for that reason. So 
we really need reconciliation. And in my view, reconciliation, as it was very well said by, by my friend Pierre Vimont, it's not just a question of, of diplomats. Thank you for the diplomats they are there to use. It's not just a question for the leaders of states, it's a question of, of population. It's a question of the business people. Business people have interest in stabilization of the situation in the world, in the world Europe. Uh, so do exactly also the, the citizens represented by the, by the member of parliament who could act also as, as bridge between, between our society. Because our common goal, we European, uh, is to, as the European Union, as a model, is to, is to rebuild the European continent, to eliminate the border, to eliminate the, the iron curtain, to develop our democratic value, our democratic principle. And for that, I think that uh, I use, will use uh, the word reconciliation as the key word of that debate. And I thank everybody for their contribution. Thank you very much. Yes, also from my side, thank you very much for being here. And uh, this is everything which is left to say. I know that some of us have to leave uh, soon now. So thank you for staying longer with us. Uh, I We really appreciate it. So thanks a lot and have a good day to everybody. Thank you, Julia, for wonderful moderation. Thank you. For thank you, Julia.